Professor McDowell, why couldn't you find some way to refute Christianity? This was a question asked by a university student to the famed Christian apologist Josh McDowell. You see, McDowell used to himself be a skeptic. He thought that Christians were out of their minds and the claims of Christ were worthless. So he determined that he would research to examine the historical evidence of the Christian faith that he would disprove the Bible and the claims of Christ. However, through his extensive research, instead of finding evidence against Christianity, he found compelling and overwhelming evidence for the reliability of the Christian faith, and McDowell himself became a Christian. So when a student at the University of Uruguay asked him this question about why he could not refute Christianity, he responded this way, quote, For a very simple reason. I was unable to explain away that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a real event in history. After spending more than 700 hours studying this subject and thoroughly investigating its foundation, I came to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is either one of the most wicked, vicious, heartless hoaxes ever fostered on humanity, or it is the most important fact in all of history. The resurrection takes the question, is Christianity valid? Out of the realm of philosophy and makes it a question of history. I want to say that last line again. I think it's so important. He said that the resurrection takes the question, is Christianity valid, out of the realm of philosophy and makes it a question of history. So this Easter morning, as we have gathered here to celebrate this resurrection of Jesus Christ, it makes it fitting to examine no more important question than the one in our text today in 1 Corinthians 15. The question is, why is the resurrection of Christ so important? Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ so important? Why are we celebrating? This importance is what the Apostle Paul argues for throughout the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. This morning, we'll just be focusing on verses 1 through 20. Here, he's writing to the Corinthian church about this important issue, but actually through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he is writing for you and me as well this morning. He's reminding us about the good news of the resurrection and establishing the proof of the resurrection so that we may understand the importance of the resurrection in our lives. Let's first look how Paul reminds us about this good news of the resurrection. Look at verses 1 and 2 with me, where Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. See, we're jumping right into the, the, a letter in progress here. Paul's been writing to this Corinthian church, but he's, he's kind of switching subjects now, and he says, now I would remind you, brothers. See, he's been talking about a range of different issues, but at this point, he, he wants to make sure that the readers slow down. So he, he says, hold on now. I want to remind you of something important. You need to pay close attention to what I'm about to say, because he's going to remind them about what? What does he say he's reminding them about here? About the, the gospel, Right? The word gospel or uh, that word evangel, it, it means, it's actually the, 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 where we get the name of our church from, evangelical. It means good news. I, I love what Pastor Tim Keller often says about this idea of good news, that the gospel is good news and not good advice. Advice is counsel about how to get something accomplished in your life. Here's what you need to do to be able to get this thing. That's really what every other religion is, right? You want to get right with God? You want to improve your life? Here is the advice of how to do that. But news is a report of something else that's done. And in fact, this good news is something that is a report about what God has done for you. Not what you have to do to earn God's favor, but how God has done that for you. And we simply have to choose how we will respond to it. Advice is the burden that's put on somebody. News takes burdens off. And that's what this good news is. This good news is that Jesus Christ has accomplished salvation for us, on our behalf. That's what we celebrate this morning. And notice, notice how Paul says that we as Christians should think about this gospel message of salvation. He says it's the thing that was preached to us, right? Now think about that word preached. Preached, is that uh, past tense, present tense, or future tense? Oh man, English lesson on a Sunday morning? (laughs) Preached, right? That's past tense, right? Preached is something that happened in the past, that this was what was preached to us. It was the gospel that we heard in the past and, and we believed in that, right? That it, through that, we experienced this experience of conversion where we had this new life as we repented and placed our trust in Jesus Christ. But this gospel, Paul says, is not only a past tense reality, 
for a Christian. He says it's also how we currently stand. I don't know. Here we go. English again. If preached was passed, stand is what tense? Pre- oh, there we go. We're awake. Good. So pre- stand is in the present tense, right? So the gospel, Paul says, is not just something, oh, I did that when I was younger and now I've moved on to other things. No, he says the gospel is not just something we experienced in the past. It's also the daily source of Christian living in the present for us as Christians. This is how we live as a disciple of Christ. We stand in this gospel. We cherish this gospel. We are continually amazed by this gospel. That's what it means to be a Christian. And then this gospel message also is how we are being saved, Paul says. So he, he almost indicates that the salvation is not complete because we're not with the Lord yet in heaven, right? So there's, there's not just a past as- aspect of the gospel, not just a present aspect of the gospel, but there's also a future aspect to the gospel that is guaranteed by the gospel. See, Paul's biblical language that he's using here says that we were saved when we believed the gospel. We are being saved as we hold fast to that gospel word, and we will be saved in the end by the gospel. The gospel is the the foundation of the entire Christian life, past, present, and future reality for the Christian, But which is kind of why Paul goes on to say, if, this is true, if you hold fast to this gospel. Now, Paul's not teaching here that true believers are in danger of losing their salvation. That would contradict what he said in other places in Scripture. And in fact, we also see that because he actually tells us what it means to hold fast. So for Paul, what does it mean to hold fast? He says that you hold fast, which means you have not believed in vain. See, hold fast, is a, it's, it's, it's not a question of losing your salvation now or in the future. It's the idea of, did you believe in the first place in vain? Did you have real, genuine salvation in the first place? That, that's evidenced by, that not having genuine salvation would be evidenced by not holding fast or letting go of the gospel. Because true saving faith in Jesus Christ is not just an experience we had in the past. It's a continual experience that we persevere in that faith in the present and in the future as well. Which is why God would continue to, how do we persevere? Well, we persevere by being reminded of this gospel, by reminding of each other of this gospel, by reminding of our own hearts of this gospel. That's what Paul is doing here to this church that he had previously preached the gospel to, and he said, let me tell you the most important thing I can tell you about. It's the gospel. That, that is what we need as Christians. So let, let's think about this gospel. What are the components that Paul would point out about this good news of the gospel? Look at verses three through five with me. Where Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. So Paul continues, and he says that this gospel message is of first importance. Now, Paul wrote a lot of stuff. He wrote most of the New Testament. And he says of everything that he taught and everything that he wrote, this is what was most important. And he says that this is the same gospel that he received. It was probably an early creed used by the apostles to make a nice summary of this gospel message. And and it's divided up into four elements, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared to witnesses, all of which, Paul says, was according to the scriptures. I don't think Paul was saying one particular scripture. He's saying the entire Old Testament scriptures were were prophesying and pointing to this reality that Paul's going to talk about. And so, First, he says that Christ died for our sins. I think about that for a second. If Christ died for our sins, if Christ died for my sins, that, that implies something, right? If Christ died for my sins, that makes me a sinner, right? It's, it's implied in his, his very statement there, he, that, that, that I have rebelled against the God of the universe who created me. That's what sin is. The Bible describes sin as rebellion. We rebelled against this God. And the wages for that rebellion, the wages for sin, the consequences of my sin is death. Either I must experience spiritual death of righteous judgment of, for my sin, or someone else is going to have to experience that for me. You see, this language that Paul's using here is the language of Christ dying for our sin, is the language of substitution. And in fact, the fancy theological term would be called substitutionary atonement. That word atonement, it can mean covering. It, it, it's it's kind of like the idea of an umbrella, Right? Thankfully, we don't need one on a beautiful day like this, but we needed one a couple weeks ago, right? And and you have that umbrella, and you have the umbrella over you, and the umbrella is taking the rain as it covers you. It is is being hit by the rain so that you are not hit by that rain. It's acting as a substitute for you. And that's the same idea here that Paul is saying, that Jesus dying for our sins, it's like Jesus, in a way, is like our umbrella. 
that he is taking the punishment, but it's not just rain falling from the sky. He's taking the punishment we deserve for our sins on himself in our place as our substitute. That we, we celebrate that when Jesus is dying on the cross is that he died and suffered as if he had committed our sins so that we could be forgiven if we place our trust in him and we could be credited as if we had lived his righteous life. To use the language of Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy about Jesus written over 700 years before his birth. It says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what we remembered on Good Friday. Right? That's, that, that we remember that Jesus' death on the cross bore the wrath of God as our substitute. Actually, maybe you're here this morning, and maybe this is new for you. Maybe you're visiting with us, us, us this morning as a non-Christian, and I want to say welcome, that we are so glad that you're here this morning. You're welcome to join us anytime. And, and, and you may be curious about what we're saying, and, and let me just explain that when we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, it wasn't just the idea of a physical punishment. It was the idea of a spiritual punishment, that he was being spiritually punished, bearing the wrath as if he had committed our sins. See, yeah, he wasn't being, he wasn't being punished for his sin. He didn't have any. He was being punished for our sin. In fact, we had a dear pastor of our church for many years that, that he would explain this to other people this way. He, he would say that, let, let's say that this hand represents you, and this hand represents God. And, 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 and you want this relationship with God. You want this eternal life, this, this, this eternal life now with God, now and forever in heaven. But let's say that this book is a record of your life, birth, death, and everything in between, including all of our sin, all of our work of rebellion against that God. And that's our life, and so we're responsible for it. It's on us. And that life keeps us from God. Actually, it more than keeps us from God. The God must, if he is a good and just God, must punish that sin. But the good news is, is that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, perfectly God and perfectly man, so that on the cross, when he died, he did not die for his sin, he died for ours. That our, the Lord laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. So that sin is no longer on us. It's on who? It's on Jesus, right? In fact, one of the last things that Jesus said on the cross was, it is finished. Another way you could say those words is paid in full. It was a, a, a term used in the marketplaces back in his time. And the idea if you wanted to buy some salt or some grain or some, some flour, that you might get, maybe even get a piece of paper stamped. It is finished or paid in full. You don't owe anything. It's all been paid for. You don't owe, owe any more money on that. And that's the idea. It, it's like a receipt, right? And that's the idea of what the cross was, is that he paid in full. It is finished. No more is owed for sin if you would put your trust in him. In fact, our, our dear Pastor Ray Castro would say that when he saw a cross, he would think of a receipt, that our sin has been paid for in full. In fact, if you're here visiting us with us this morning, and you would like to know what it is to have your sin paid for, all your sin, all your guilt, all your shame, that Jesus would have paid that for you. We would love to tell you more about that. Please talk to myself. Talk to, I'll be at the back afterwards, or talk to the person who brought you, or talk to any member of our church. We would love to tell you more about this Jesus and how you can have your sin paid for in full, because that's what he accomplished on the cross. That's that first element of the gospel Paul states. Secondly, Paul emphasized that Jesus was buried. Now, why is that important? Well, that's the evidence that Jesus really died, right? That his dead corpse was laid in the tomb. But he didn't stay in that tomb. Because thirdly, Paul reminds us that he was raised on the third day. Or as my, my son Isaac used to say, before he could say the word resurrection, uh, he used to say, I said, Isaac, did he stay in the tomb? He goes, no, he got up. <laughs> and you know what? He got up. He did. He got up he, on the third day, just as Jesus had predicted about himself, he rose from the dead. He displayed that he was truly God and truly the Savior he claimed to be by proving that he could really offer this eternal life to us, as Pastor Bob said, because he was no longer dead. He showed that he had victory over death. So you see, what Paul is saying is that without the resurrection, there is no gospel. Without the resurrection, there is no good news. That the resurrection is the evidence that this gospel message is true. It, it, who cares if Jesus claimed to die for sins if he never rose from the dead? Right? 
but he has risen to show that he has victorious power over sin and Satan and death. And as Pastor Bob said, that is, is, is why Christianity is different from every other religion in the world, right? It is different in one way because instead of every other religion in the world and the idea of what can we do for God? How do we be good enough for God? Christianity says, here is what God has done for us. And he has proved that in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, one Buddhist le uh, leader once wrote, once wrote when Buddha died, it was with the utter pa passing away in which nothing, whatever, remains. He's dead. He's gone. Muhammad died in Medina on June 8th, 632, and his tomb is still there. And, and it's visited yearly by thousands of Muslims who would come and mourn his death. But we gather here this morning, and actually we gather here every Sunday morning, not to mourn Jesus' death, but to celebrate that he is no longer dead that he rose victoriously over sin and death. And we know this is true. And we know this is certain. How do we know? Well, fourthly, Paul, Paul tells us that he appeared to Cephas. That's another name for Peter and the 12 disciples. See, this is what's in for, first importance. This is the past and present and future foundation of the Christian life, this gospel of the resurrection. And if that is supposed to be first importance, we really should ask ourselves, is that first importance for us? So let me ask as we think about this, three things of our church. Is this important? Is this gospel important to us? First, let me ask, do we live in light of this gospel? Do we think the gospel is just something we believed in the past? I heard the gospel, I believe, now I'm moving on to other Christian things. That's not how Paul thought about it. That's not how the Bible talks about it. Do we, do we live, live these lives where and I, as I wake in the morning, as I go through the day, that I live in light of that gospel of mercy and grace that God has done for me? Are we, being, are we looking for ways to continually remind ourselves of the gospel and be reminded of the gospel so that we would live in light of God's grace and mercy? Secondly, are we, are we protecting this gospel? See, Paul very clearly states what the gospel is, and are we aware when there are other people or even other churches who would take this gospel and would, would distort it, would distort different elements of it? Are we aware of that? Does it matter when a, when, when a friend or a person says that the gospel is that Jesus died so you can be his friend? Well, one, of, one of the wonderful truths is that Jesus died, and yes, we can be reconciled to God, but there's no mention of, of what he said here, if Jesus died for our sins. There's no mention of the re resurrection. Or this idea that, that you can be saved if you ask Jesus into your heart. That's not a bad thing to say, but it's incomplete, right? It's incomplete with this aspect of Jesus died for our sins and was raised. How should we respond to our critiques when other people say, you know what, Christianity is too focused on this death and resurrection of Jesus. We need to make it more about community and more about spirituality. You know, community is important, and spirituality is a, is a wonderful gift from the Spirit. But that's nothing without Christ's death and resurrection. If this gospel is of first importance to us and to Paul and to God, then it's something that we must work to protect in our lives and as a church. Thirdly, there's a question of, is this gospel something we emphasize regularly as a church? I mean, that's why we should come to church, right? Not just on Easter, but every Sunday. Did you know that actually, that the early church for about 300 years did not have a regular Easter celebration, right? We love Easter. It's a wonderful thing. But the, for the first several hundred years of the church, there was no annual Easter celebration. Now, I'm not saying we should not celebrate Easter. But what I'm saying is the early church said one Sunday a year, that's not enough. That's not enough to celebrate. That's not enough to be reminded. We need to be reminded regularly of Jesus rising from the dead. So you know what they did? They had 52 Easter celebrations, one each and every Sunday morning. Each and every Sunday morning was Easter. Every Sunday morning is Easter, right? That's why we gather to worship on Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning is Easter. It's not that we shouldn't celebrate today. We should. Praise God for the resurrection. But we should treat each and every Sunday morning by being reminded of the truth. We gather here. We worship. We study his word because he is risen. He is risen indeed. So we sing songs about the gospel, and we, we hear scriptures about the gospel, and we're exhorted by the gospel in the sermon. We visibly see the gospel as, 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 there, as we partake in communion and baptism. In fact, one of my weekly prayers for this church is that we would be gospel-centered and Christ-centered as a church. It's because, it's, it's because we, we cherish that gospel. That's the reason we share it to others. Not, to, not that God would approve of us more and, or check something off my Christian duty. No, we share the gospel with others because we're reminded of how much the gospel means to us. That, that's why Joe shared about this, this opportunity to invite people to this pizza outreach. It's not just about giving them pizza. It's so that they would hear the gospel because of what the gospel did to us. So we'd invite our friends and family to hear these, the gospel and these reasonable answers to their questions. 
that would hold them back from understanding that gospel. In fact, if you haven't thought of someone to invite to that outreach or to, to church, please, please do. Because the gospel is that important. But Paul doesn't just stop with reminding us about this good news of the gospel of the resurrection. He also might continue to examine the proof of the resurrection. In other words, Paul would say, how do we know this claim of Jesus Christ is true? He's almost expecting someone to have that re- reaction, right? How do, you, how do I know he really rose from the dead? Well, in this passage, Paul gives us three evidences to prove the resurrection is a ho- historical fact. Look back there at verse 4, where Paul tells us, or we read, that Jesus was uh, buried and rose. His dead corpse is laid in a solid rock tomb. A huge stone weighing approximately two tons was rolled over the entrance, and a Roman guard of strictly disciplined men was stationed to watch the tomb. These men would have been flawless in their attention to duty because they know that the penalty of, of, of letting anything happen to that tomb would have been their deaths. And yet, as Pastor Bob read earlier out of John, that Sunday morning, the Roman seal was broken. The massive, tomb, massive stone was rolled away. The elite guard unit had fled, and the women came to the tomb and found it empty. They panicked. They went to tell the disciples. Peter and John ran to the tomb. John arrived first but didn't enter, and as they looked inside, they saw the grave clothes folded up by themselves, but no body. Not nobody. Well, there was nobody, but there was also no body, right? There's there's no one in there. You see, there's almost no intellectually credible person today that would say that Jesus was not a historical figure, that he really did live and that he died and was buried. Pretty much everyone, even skeptics, would say that. There's also agreement that that tomb was empty. Why why is there agreement about that? You see, if the tomb wasn't empty, the Jews and the Romans who were trying to stop this early Christian movement could have easily crushed Christianity. You know how? Just bring the body out. You claim he rose from the dead? He's rotting right here, right? It would have been easy. So everyone says, of course, that that tomb is empty. And in fact, we also have evidence that, that none of the early Christians even went to worship at the tomb of Jesus. They didn't even bother to venerate where it was. You know why? Because it doesn't matter where it was, because it's empty, right? It wasn't until about 300 AD until they considered, considered marking the location. So how do we know that the resurrection is a historical fact? Because of the empty tomb. Secondly, look at verses 5 through 7. He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. I got a question here. Why does Paul spend so much time emphasizing these resurrection appearances? I mean, think about it. Jesus' death on the cross, that gets a half a verse, right? The resurrection appearances, that got four verses. I mean, I, why, right? He, keeps, he just keeps going on about all these appearances. He appeared to Cephas. That's an Aramaic name for Peter. He appeared to the 12 disciples, including Judas' replacement, Matthias. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time. Paul says most of these guys are still alive. He's kind of, kind of probably saying, you don't believe me? Go ask them. They all saw him. Some of them have fallen asleep. That's Paul's language for death of a Christian. But most of them are still alive. You can go ask them yourself. First-hand testimony witness that Jesus really rose from the dead. And then Jesus appeared to the apostles, a group larger than the 12. And last of all, we'll see that he uh, appeared to Paul on the Damascus Road. Why does Paul emphasize so many of these appearances? Because it's the proof. It's the proof that the resurrection really happened. See, even skeptics would have to historically admit that, that they experienced something. Something happened to make them believe, at least they believe they saw the resurrected Jesus. Now, some liberal scholars would say that's nothing more than a hallucination they experienced, or maybe they had some bad Taco Bell the night before. But, but, but you see, this, this had to be, first of all, how does bad Taco Bell cause 500 people to have the same hallucination at the same exact time, right? And, and secondly, the, the, this, this experience had to be strong enough and undeniable enough to believe that Jesus had really risen from the dead and willing to give their lives for that belief, which they did. So how do we know that the resurrection is a historical fact? Because of the resurrection appearances. Thirdly, look at verses 8 through 11 for our third evidence. Paul says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. 
Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. So Paul talks about all these other experiences and it makes him think about his own experience with the risen Christ. That Jesus appeared to him as one untimely born. I think that the CSB translation of the Bible puts that well of born at the wrong time or its footnote to say his birth was unusual. See, Paul is saying that his salvation experience and his call to an apostle was unusual compared to the other apostles like Peter and John. Why? Why does he say that? Why does he say that he is the least of all the apostles? He's unworthy to be called an apostle. Well, he tells us why, right? Because, because why? Because he persecuted the church of God. See, Paul was there supporting the murder of the very first Christian martyr in Acts 7. He then, in Acts 8, was the one going from house to house, dragging off men and women to prison simply because they were Christians. In his own words, in his own description in Galatians 1, he said that he was violently trying to destroy the church. How does he go from one trying to arrest and kill Christians to one who is the proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because on the Damascus Road in Acts 9, he met that resurrected Jesus Christ. He repented and he believed. And he went from being a violent persecutor of the church to being being willing to die for Christ and his church because he experienced this resurrection. See, see, Paul recognized that, 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 he, that Jesus was raised and that Jesus had had grace with him. So he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He, he realized that even though he was unworthy, even though he had rejected God, even though he had scorned God, Jesus Christ offered him grace and forgiveness through his own death and resurrection. Actually, maybe you're here this morning and you feel that you've re- rejected God, you've scorned God, so, so God, you don't have another chance with God. Yes, you do. We see with Paul that God continues to offer grace and mercy to us. It was that grace that enabled Paul to carry out his own ministry as an apostle. You see, the gospel and this grace and the resurrection was not just something Paul said, yeah, okay, check the box, I understand that, now I'm moving on to something else. No, the gospel was something continually on Paul's mind. That this gospel and resurrection and grace was what transformed him and caused him to then go and love others. And and Paul's just one of these examples of transformed lives. We see that in the the disciples as well. You have these men who were cowering in the upper room, afraid that the same thing that happened to their leader was going to happen to them, that they would all be killed. And then they encounter the resurrected Christ. They're filled with the Spirit. And these cowards then go to be proclaimers of the gospel. And all of them go on to be such proclaimers that they're willing to die martyrs' deaths. All of them died for their faith, except one, John, who was exiled on the island of Patmos. We also see a radical change, as I said, in the early church. I, I, just imagine being a Jewish Christian where the entire life you're taught in the Old Testament commandment that, that, that you should honor the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is Saturday, the seventh day of the week. And then all of a sudden you say, Saturday doesn't matter. We're worshiping on Sunday. What happened? Jesus happened, right? To convince them to say, this, this is our Lord and God. So what, how do we know that the resurrection is a fact? Because of the, radically changes in the radical changes in the early church. The point here is that Christ's resurrection is confirmed by incontrovertible proof. Our faith in the gospel is not blind faith. It is based on fact. These three proofs are historically certain. There was an empty tomb. There were post-mortem appearances by the church. And there was a radical change in the church. So they're willing to die for this belief that Jesus rose from the dead. How do you account for those? If you don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, you have to account for these somehow. These are historical facts. Let let me share with you some of the theories that people have come up through throughout history, but they just fail to account for these. There's the wrong tomb theory. Some people say the women went to the wrong tomb, met a gardener, oh, maybe it's Jesus, and and thought the body was gone. The whole thing is just some confusion by a bunch of women. That's the theory, not me. What's the problem? What's the problem here, right? If they were mistaken and the body is still in the tomb, it would have been easy to discredit them. In fact, the Bible holds up these women as the epitome of wonderful, believable witnesses, right? And and so because it would have been easy to discredit them to say the body's still there. So obviously that doesn't account for the facts. There's also the hallucination theory, which I shared earlier, that some people thought that people just were hallucinating they saw Jesus, well, besides that fact of the problem of 500 people hallucinating the same thing at the same time, there's also still the problem of where's the body? Still in the tomb. Doesn't account for the empty tomb. There's also the swoon theory. This one is very creative. This is the theory that Jesus did not really die on the cross. Jesus just fainted from exhaustion and loss of blood. Everyone thought that Jesus was dead. And so in the cold tomb, he was resuscitated. And, and then he 
got out and made people think I'm risen from the dead. Well, there's multiple problems with this one. Uh, just to, in addition to the fact that the Romans were professional executioners and did not make mistakes when they're killing people. Let me quote, actually, the best uh, person to, to refute this is John Stott. I like his quote. He says this, Are we then seriously to believe that Jesus was all the time only in a swoon? That after the rigors and pains of trial, mockery, flogging, crucifixion, that he could survive 36 hours in a stone tomb with neither warmth nor food nor the tending of his wounds? That then this broken man could rally sufficiently to perform the superhuman feat of shifting this boulder from the mouth of the tomb. Of course, doing that without disturbing the Roman guards. And then this weak and sickly and hungry and bleeding Jesus could appear to his disciples and give them the impression that he had really vanquished death. Would you believe that? It would take really amazingly blind faith to believe that. Then there's the stolen body theory. That's the, the theory that the disciples stole the body while the guards were taking a nap, and they're claiming that the Jesus had raised, been resurrected so they could be leaders and rich and powerful leaders of the new church. Well, there's some problems here. First of all, Roman guards did not take naps like that. They're not big on nap breaks in the Roman army, from my understanding. And also, they probably would notice that giant stone being moved. But it also doesn't explain the change in the disciples. If they knew the whole thing was a hoax, if they knew the whole thing was a lie, they were not going to die for a lie. So none of these theories can account for those basic historical facts. Uh, besides the truth that the New Testament claims, that Jesus rose from the dead, I would say that there's only one theory that comes close to covering those facts. It covers those three, but not the rest, rest of the New Testament covers. And it is probably the most absurd theory of them all. This is called the twin brother theory. Anyone ever heard this one before? This theory proposes that Jesus actually had a twin brother, neither of which was born to Mary, because Mary probably, as my wife pointed out when I was talking to her this morning, Mary would have known if there were two babies and not one. No, no, they were both born, they were twins born to another mom, and somehow one of those twins got switched with Jesus sometime, I don't know, mangerish, I don't know. And so they got switched somehow. And so Mary doesn't know that the baby's not hers, and Jesus doesn't know he has a brother, but the other brother knows that Jesus is his twin brother. Kind of, got it? Okay. And then Jesus grows up, he becomes this famed teacher and religious leader, and as I said, the brother knows about Jesus, but Jesus doesn't know about his brother. The twin comes to admire Jesus, and when Jesus tragically dies, he, this brother decides to, to continue Jesus' work by stealing the body and showing up in front of the disciples and saying, I'm raising from the dead, and sends them on the Christian mission. Now, I do admit, this does account for the empty tomb, for the appearances, and for the change in the church. Now, of course, there's a lot more New Testament evidence that this does not account for. But I think that's the best you're going to get. And this is a theory that was come up with uh, a couple decades ago. So 2,000 years after the fact, there's not a single proof of historical or manuscript evidence, but at least it might sound good. But which is easier to believe? That Jesus is raised from the dead and that millions of people believe that they, he has made himself known to them in a personal new, personal new birth or that all these lines of evidence can be explained by a hoax by a twin brother that, by the way, we have no historic, not a single bit of manuscript evidence for, unlike the thousands of manuscripts we have in the New Testament. And, and, and the, the, this idea that would come up by a man 2,000 years after the fact, and that would assume that all the millions of people since have been deluded by this hoax and to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead. You see, when you look at all these things, the, the only credible solution is that the Bible is true and that Jesus is risen from the dead because he is God. It's pretty much a historical fact. Do you believe that? If you don't believe that, you have to account for the evidence. What do you do with the historical proof? That's, that's one of the things. When I talk to friends and people I meet that are non-Christians, and as we talk and we dialogue and we share, one of the, the, just to be intellectually honest, I ask, I'm just curious, how do you account for the, these facts of the resurrection? Because all these other theories are illogical and unhistorical, but you have to, to be intellectually honest. You have to come up with something. You have to have some theory. How do you explain the empty tomb and the resurrection appearances and the changed church? See, our, our faith is not based on just a feeling. We're not just based on, on, on a whim or what, something we've been told. This is based on fact, that we believe and know that there is a resurrected Savior. And we also, as Christians, understand that this resurrection is our so, source for hope as believers. 
See, this is why Paul is pointing this out. He's pointing out the good news of the resurrection, and he's pointing out the proof of the resurrection so that to establish the importance of the resurrection for our lives. In fact, let's look at that finally. Let's look at verses 12 and 13, where Paul continues and says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Now some of the Corinthians were probably saying, had some idea that there was no future physical resurrection for Christians. They might have said that Jesus raised from the dead, but any idea that 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 affects us, that we're going to be raised from the dead, that's some sort of fairy tale. And Paul says, okay, so for the sake of argument, let's just pretend that possession is correct. Let's just pretend that there is no such thing as a bodily resurrection. In that case, not even Jesus would have been raised. That's what he says. And then he says, if Jesus has not been raised, there's some implications, there's some consequences for us. Look at verses 14 through 18, where he says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are to be found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. And if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then, also, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So Paul says, Let's, if we were to go along your, your train of argument, Corinthian church, if Christ has not been raised, then Paul's preaching and the Corinthians' faith is in vain. Or, or as the New King James would translate this, their faith is empty. Our faith is empty. It has no substance to it. Why? Because if Christ did not raise, the gospel's not true. We said that earlier. It's a false gospel. It's a lie. If Jesus did not conquer sin, death, and hell, if he died and he stayed dead, then we are believing a lie. We're trusting in a dead Savior to give us life. How foolish that is. How foolish it would be to trust our lives to a lie. It would be literally the same thing as believing that Superman's going to appear to save us. Or Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's our only hope. But it's even worse than that. Paul continues in verse 15 to say if Jesus was not resurrected, not only is the gospel a lie, but also all those who preach the gospel are misrepresenting God. They are lying about God. If there's no resurrection from the dead, then every person who has ever preached the gospel of Jesus Christ is a liar. From the Apostle Paul to Martin Luther, from Billy Graham to Martin Luther King, to the pastors and elders of this church, to yourself as a Christian, we're all liars. Actually, Paul doesn't say it explicitly, but I think he goes beyond that in his implications where he would imply then that if the resurrection is not true, Jesus Christ himself is a liar because Jesus claimed that he would die and rise again. You see, if there is no resurrection, Jesus should not be treated as a good religious leader. He should be treated as a vile deceiver. But, But that's not all. Paul says it's even worse than that. In verse 17, Paul goes on to say that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. As the CSB and the NASB translate it, your faith is worthless. If there's no resurrection, your faith has no worth. It's useless. It lacks the power to help you with what you need most, most, both in life and in death. You see, without Christ's resurrection, you're still in your sins. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, he never really paid for your sins, which means you're still dead in your trespasses and sins and under the wrath of God. This means also, as Paul points out in verse 18, that those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those those Christians who have died are not with the Lord in heaven, but they have perished. If Christ did not raise from the dead, there's no such thing as eternal life in him. The heroes of the Bible, faithful Christian men and women throughout history, Christian loved ones, they have perished along with the rest of fallen humanity. Then look how Paul concludes his argument. Look at verse 19. He says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, We are of all people the most to be pitied. Paul focuses all back on us, right? It's not just a theological argument. It's not just an intellectual argument. He says, if we have no hope beyond this life, if we have no hope of a future resurrection, if we have no hope that Jesus brings us to be with him, then if all the hope we have is Christianity is good to make me have the best life I can now, Paul says that Christians deserve pity that's reserved for fools. 
Now, what, someone might say, but there's so many benefits of the Christian, Christian religion. There's so much benefits of Christianity. I mean, just look at the benefits of, of community and fellowship and church life. Look at the benefits of, 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 of becoming a better and moral person. But for Paul, that, that's not what defines the Christian life. He says we go to church and we engage in community and we grow in holiness. But that's not an end in itself. That doesn't give us an end in itself. All those experiences are because of the grace we've experienced. And if there is no grace, if there's no resurrection, then there's no grace. Those things mean nothing. Much more, he says, the Christian life is usually not defined with all these blessings. But often, the Christian life is filled with struggle and suffering. We, we, we don't store up treasures on earth because we store up our treasures in heaven. That, that we have found the pearl of great price. Jesus Christ, and we have given up everything because we cherish him as our treasure. That's the Christian life. And, and that's, the only, that's the only way to look at the Christian life that would make sense of this verse, to say that if there is no resurrection, this Christian life deserves to be pitied. I, I'm so helped by how John MacArthur explains this. He says this, quote, to have hoped in Christ in this life only would be to teach, preach, suffer, sacrifice, and work entirely for nothing. If Christ is still dead, then not only can he not help us in regard to the life to come, but he cannot help us now if he cannot grant us eternal life. He cannot improve our earthly life. If he is not alive, where would our source of peace, joy, or satisfaction be now? The Christian life would be a mockery, a charade, a tragic joke, deserving pity reserved for fools. But we know that's not the case, right? We know as Christians we are not to be so pitied. Because look at what Paul immediately says next. Look at verse 20, our last verse. Paul says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul says all the ideas that the Corinthians had, he rejects those. He rejects all the consequences he just laid out because there's not a question to whether or not Jesus is raised from the dead. He has been risen from the, empty dead, from the, from the, from the dead. The empty tomb is there. The eyewitness testimonies are true. And the changed lives prove that it is so. And because Christ has been risen, there is a guarantee that we have the same hope, that we have the same resurrection guaranteed for us as well. Paul says that this resurrection is the first fruits of the resurrection of all those who believe in him. See, in the Old Testament, the first fruits were the, the first parts of the harvest. If you, were, if you were harvesting grain or barley and you brought in those first portions, that was the, the picture that God, it was a guarantee and a promise that God would provide the rest of the harvest to come. And Paul's using that picture as a metaphor here. And so Paul's point is, Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits. That, knowing that Jesus raised from the dead, that is our guarantee that those who trust in him and his gospel will be raised from the dead to eternal life as well. And you know, if we think about it, if we think about it, because Christ has been raised, for those who repented and placed their trust in him, who are holding fast in him, everything that Paul just said in the last few verses, the opposite is true for us. Let me go through that real quick to, to, to see what does this mean for us? What does this mean for you and me that have trusted in Christ? If we think about the opposite of everything that, that Paul just said, because he has risen, because Christ is risen, our preaching is not in vain. It is true. We can believe all that is taught to us from the Bible is the truth of God himself. Because Christ is risen, our faith is not in vain. We have trusted our lives to the only one who can give life because he has risen from the dead to conquer sin, hell, and death. Because Christ is risen, we do not represent God. We have the truth of God. So we should go out boldly and tell people about this risen Savior and how they can experience his resurrection life. Because Christ is risen, we are no longer in our sins. We have been forgiven of every sin, past, present, and future. Because we live in the gospel, we no longer live in guilt, but in grace. Because Christ has risen, those who have died in Christ, and when we die in Christ, we do not perish. But as Jesus told the thief on the cross, he will tell the same thing to us. Today you will be with me in paradise. This is the first fruit guarantees. Jesus' resurrection is that proof for us of God's guarantee of the resurrection life he offers us as well. Again, I'll say one more time. If you're visiting with us this morning and you're not a Christian, we would love to tell you more about this Jesus. We'd more, love to tell you more about this resurrection life and how you can experience that as a pure, free gift by grace. Because that's what we're celebrating this morning. We're gathering in the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Martin Luther King stated in his Easter sermon 60 years ago, quote, 
Easter comes out ringing in terms that we all hear if we seek to hear it, that the soul of man is immortal. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have fit testimony that this earthly life is not the end, that death is just something of a turn in the road, that life moves down a continually moving river, and that death is just a little turn in the river, that this earthly life is merely an embryonic prelude to a new awakening, that death is not a period which ends the great sentence of life, but a comma that punctuates it to more loftier significance. That is what Easter says. That is the meaning of Easter. That is the question that Easter answered, that death is not the end. There is a resurrection because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's what we celebrate today. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Father, we thank you, and we thank you that we can celebrate that. We can celebrate this truth, and this truth not based on tradition, not based on emotional appeal, not based on blind faith, but based on the truth and the evidence that you have given, that you proved that the resurrection is true, and that that resurrection is the foundation of this gospel message, that we can have forgiveness in that resurrection, and eternal life in that resurrection, a resurrection life in, that resurre in, that, in his resurrection, Lord, because of grace is a free gift. And so, Father, we desire to live in that grace. We desire to live in that gospel. We desire to be those who would remind each other of that gospel as we rejoice in that gospel and your amazing grace. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.